I'm delighted to be able to come here and talk to you, and to talk to you about something which to many clinical endocrinologists is actually rather an inconvenient truth. And that is basically that when you're talking about glucocorticoids and measuring glucocorticoids, uh, looking at what they're doing at one, any one point in time is telling you very little indeed. And I'm going to go through this uh, just slide by slide. First of all, I've got no potential conflicts of interest. And when we talk about the HPA axis, I think the first thing that it's important to get across is that it's two things. It has to do two separate things. It's a major homeostatic system. It's a ba major system which keeps all the body's biochemistry uh, in its optimal state. But it's also a stress response system. And these are different things. And in order to be able to achieve both of these, there are various things that it needs to do. It needs to be able to anticipate events. It needs it's an anticipatory hormone. It needs to go up before it's needed. So it needs to be able to anticipate when it's going to be needed. It needs to be very sensitive. It's got to respond to both small and to large stimuli. It's got to be robust. It's got to preserve its dynamic behavior during perturbations, during stressful situations. And it's also got to show plasticity so that it can adapt to different circumstances, uh, which some people call to allostasis. And what I want to get through to you today is the way it achieves all of these things is by a combination of different types of cyclical activity, by a combination of circadian and ultradian oscillations of cortisol. Now, Russell Foster gave you a little start, gave, gave me a bit of help from his talk yesterday because he talked a little bit about circadian rhythms. Now, we live on this planet, and on this planet it rotates every 24 hours, and so you have alternate periods of dark and light, and depending whether or not you're diurnal like humans or you're nocturnal like most rodents, there is a time of rest and there's a time of activity, and your body needs to be tuned in a different way during the periods of rest and activity to best adapt you to what's going on. So the HP axis is one of the various axes which can anticipate the need for activity during the light period. So if we actually look at the clock, and the major clock which uh, Russell Foster talked about together yesterday, which obviously isn't as big as I've put it here, it's a suprachiasmatic nucleus. This is a body clock in the hypothalamus which tells effectively your time of day and can organize your body temperature and all sorts of other things, including the activity of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Now, the SCM projects to the hypothalamus. Uh, it, which it regulates the release of corticotrophin releasing hormone, which then acts on the anterior pituitary, which produces ACTH, and ACTH produces cortisol. And because the clock is in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, your anticipation is that it would give you a simple 24-hour rhythm. And so what one's expectation is, is that at night time, there would be very low levels of cortisol. Then before you wake up, it would increase, and then it would slowly decrease throughout the rest of the day. But actually, if you look at any one individual, it's quite different. It's certainly very low at night, but then at about three in the morning, you start getting these huge oscillations of cortisol, which continue throughout the rest of the day. So it's a very episodic, pulsatile release of cortisol. This, uh, this episodic release of cortisol happens in every mammalian species that's been tested. So, for instance, this is what happens in the rodent. The rodent's nocturnal, so these pulses anticipate activity, the active period, which is the active period at night. And then in humans, of course, uh, you get these pulses uh, during the night, just before you wake up, and they decrease throughout the day. So the first question we had was, where does this oscillating activity come from? And we presume, we thought to begin with, that maybe it's in the hypothalamus, it's in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, but there is absolutely no evidence for that at all. And to cut a long story short, the culprit, very unexpectedly, is actually the adrenal gland. And the reason for that is that cortisol is an extremely lipophilic hormone. That means it can't be stored in granules. 
And that means that every single pulse of cortisol you see is newly synthesized cortisol. And the relevance of that is that every time ACTH hits the adrenal gland and hits the MC2 receptors, there is a delay before the adrenal glands make ACTH. So we have a feed-forward system here and a feed-backward system. A feed-forward system causing the secretion of cortisol and a feedback system turning off ACTH. And as any engineers or mathematicians in the audience will know, that any feed-forward feedback system with any delays in it has to oscillate. It just simply has to oscillate as a matter of fact. So we discussed this with our mathematical colleagues, and they came up uh, with this uh, diagram of what they thought must be going on. So what we have here, this is a mathematical model. We have CRH in the hypothalamus, which then acts on the pituitary. Pituitary makes ACGH, and the ACGH acts on the adrenal to make cortisol, which then feeds back. So what we have in the x-axis here is the adrenal delay, the delay of ACGH hitting the adrenal and the adrenal making cortisol. And on the y-axis here, we have the drive from the hypothalamus. Everywhere within this blue Hopf transition curve here, you have to oscillate. Cortisol has to oscillate. So basically, low, at this level here, where there is no CRH, so there's basically no stimulation from the hypothalamus, you're going to get almost no ACTH, no cortisol, and you'll have no oscillations. As you increase this, the drive from the hypothalamus, you go into this blue zone in which you have to have oscillations of ACTH and cortisol. And then as you get very, very high levels of CRH, you will come out of this blue zone and you will, get, uh, you will lose your oscillations. Now, there's no point doing these mathematical models unless you can actually test them. So just let me just re remind you what our hypothesis is. If we have high constant levels of CRH, what we'd, in this area here, we'd expect a large increase of ACTH and cortisol, and then it basically to flatten out. If we have an intermediate level of constant CRH here, we, which is within this blue zone, we would have these oscillations of ACTH which would continue. So that's what we predict. Nice thing about doing, looking at rats is that in the daytime, the rats produce no CRH at all. And so we can actually infuse them a constant infusion of CRH and look what happens. So when we give a high dose of CRH, so this is a constant infusion of CRH, you'll see that their corticosterone levels go up and they basically, they basically stay up. Then if we give them an intermediate level, this is just one animal. Remember, this is a constant infusion of CRH. There's no pulses of CRH, there's a constant infusion. You get these beautiful pulses hourly pulses of corticosterone. And if we look at in eight different animals you hear, you'll see that this is constant CRH and you get these beautiful pulses, one hourly pulses of corticosterone. So we have a sub-hypothalamic pulse generator created by the interaction which emerges between the pituitary and the adrenal cortex. So what's actually happening is in the human here, let's say at night, there's nothing much going on. Then late in the evening, your CRH neurons fire. They produce CRH, it goes to the pituitary. Your pituitary makes ACTH, it goes to the adrenal as a delay. The adrenal then makes cortisol. It feeds back on the pituitary. It turns off the pituitary ACTH, which then stops the secretion of cortisol. The feedback stops and then you start the cycle, and the cycle continues. So that's what's actually going on, and that is where the episodic secretion of cortisol comes from. So, having seen this, the next question was, does it matter? Is this just an epiphenomenon, and it just happens because that's the way it happens? So we wanted to look at two things. The first thing was obviously for the whole of the duration of the animal's and the human's life, you have been seeing pulses of ACTH and pulses of cortisol. Have your glands adapted to this? So the first thing we did was to look at what it means at the level of the adrenal gland. So here you have a whole load of rats. Uh, I think it was uh, 10 rats. And we just looked at uh, every uh, half hour, at their level, actually I think it was every 10 minutes at their levels of corticosterone. And you see a nice diurnal rhythm. You can't see the ultradian rhythm because we've meaned all of the animals. We can see this lovely diurnal rhythm here. Uh, 
Then what we did was we gave these rats methylprednisolone in their drinking water. Basically, we gave them steroid to turn off their ACTH, and if we turn off their ACTH, they obviously don't make any corticosterone. So you've got a nice model here. You've got rats with normal adrenal glands but no ACTH, and we can now look at those to see whether or not they recognize a pulsatile signal of ACTH. So in the animals with the methylprednisolone, we gave them back pulses of ACTH. So we gave them pulses of ACTH every hour, and you can see they produce these beautiful pulses of corticosterone. So you've got a lovely responsive adrenal gland to pulses of ACTH. The next thing we did was we gave exactly the same dose of ACTH, but rather than giving it in pulses, we gave it as a constant infusion, and when we did that, the adrenal ignored it completely. So the adrenal is adapted to seeing pulses of ACTH. Obviously, if you give a massive dose of ACTH, you, will, you can push the adrenal to work. But within physiological levels, it is just set up to respond to these pulses. And we looked in detail why this was the case. And again, I don't have time to go through this in detail. But just to remind you, the rate-limiting step uh, uh, on the synthesis of cortisol is STAR. STAR is stimulated by SF1 and it's inhibited by DAX1. When ACTH hits the MC2 receptor, it, uh, in, within the signaling within the cell turns off DAX1 and turns on SF1. You produce cortisol. Cortisol then feeds back and actually activates DAX1 and turns off STAR. So actually within the adrenal cell itself, you've got a feed forward and feed back mechanism. It works really well when you get a pulse of ACTH because you put the foot on the accelerator and take your foot off the brake. But if you keep your foot on the accelerator, you're accelerating, but then the brake turns on on its own, and so that your adrenal cell becomes less responsive to a continuous activation by ACTH than it does to pulsatile ACTH. Okay, what about the rest of the tissues? You've also got pulsatile cortisol going around the whole of the body, uh, and we as endocrinologists are extremely interested in whether or not that's important for the way the body responds to cortisol. So, we have pulses of cortisol. What does cortisol do? It goes through the bloodstream, and then it goes into cells, and in cells it combines to either glucocorticoid receptors or mineralocorticoid receptors. These translocate these translocate to the numerous, into the nucleus, they dimerize, and they bind to glucocorticoid response elements uh, and activate transcription. Now, what we can do is we can look at this, and what we uh, did with Gordon Hager in the States is that we created cells uh, in which had large numbers of these glucocorticoid response elements, about 2,000 of them, all next to each other on the DNA. So that meant that if we can have fluorescent glucocorticoid receptors, we can actually see where they bind to the DNA because it fluoresces, because they're all these binding sites all next to each other. So the design of this study, this is a cell culture study, we have no, corti oh, no corticosterone, we give a pulse of corticosterone, we wash it off, a pulse of corticosterone, we wash it off, and another, and another pulse of corticosterone. So to begin with, you can see the green is green fluorescent protein bound to glucocorticoid receptor. It's mainly in the cytoplasm. We give a pulse of glucocorticoid, a uh, pulse of corticosterone. You can see it all goes into the nucleus, and it binds to all these GREs in the nucleus. We wash it off. It comes off the DNA. Put another pulse on. It binds to the DNA. Another wash. It comes off. Another pulse, and it binds. So it, it's binding, coming on, coming off, coming on, coming off the glucocorticoid response elements on the DNA. What about the mineralocorticoid receptor? I'm just showing you one pulse here, and the mineralocorticoid receptor uh, is bound to M-cherry, so it's red. We put a pulse of glucocorticoid on, and it goes from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. It binds to the GREs, so you can see this red spot here. We wash it off, and it remains bound. So the GR binds and comes off, the MR binds and it remains bound. So what we're actually seeing then is we're getting pulses of glucocorticoid and at the peak of each pulse you've got the glucocorticoid receptor and the mineralocorticoid receptor bound to DNA and at the nadir of each pulse the GR comes off the DNA and the MR remains bound. And so as you can imagine the pattern of 
glucocorticoid that is seen by the cell will differentially affect uh, MR and GR. Does it actually matter? Does it matter? Well, it does. So this is just looking in the hippocampus. So this is in vivo. We're looking at rats. We've taken their adrenals out, and we've given them pulses of corticosterone back. So if we measure corticosterone in the plasma in green, this is levels of corticosterone in the plasma. Uh, we then look at the amount of binding of glucocorticoid receptor to GREs on the DNA. You can see these pulses of binding to the DNA. And then if we look at transcription, we're looking at the heteronuclear RNA of a gene called period one. You can see that this is actually pulsing. So you can see gene pulsing, genes turning on, turning off, turning on, turning off with every single pulse of corticosterone. Remember, this is in the brain in vivo, is what we're actually looking at. So does it actually matter in man? Uh, obviously, those, are, those sort of studies are not the sort of studies that you can do in man. Uh, but what Georgina Russell has done is she has developed a pump system uh, in which she can reproduce physiological levels of, of, of cortisol. And if we look in red, this is just a level in a normal person. And if we look in black, this is somebody whose own endogenous cortisol is blocked with metaropone and is being replaced by our pump. And basically, they're not exactly superimposable, but they're incredibly similar. So she can reproduce normal pulsatile uh, cortisol in man. And so basically what we can do and what we have done is we have compared physiological cortisol but by giving these large pulses late at night and then in the morning and decreasing through the day with exactly the same dose of cortisol but giving it smoothly increasing, ramping it up overnight and then decreasing today. And I won't talk much more about this but comparing it with oral treatment which starts obviously after you wake up and then you have these pulses later on in the day. And so basically, we looked at a whole lot of, first of all, we've actually done this in patients with Addison's, but we haven't uh, completely evaluated all the data yet, but this is in normal patients on metaropone. The ones we're comparing subjects have this smooth infusion of cortisol with the ones who have this more physiological pulsatile cortisol. And we look at various indices in the subjects uh, when they have these two types of infusion. So first of all, looking at sleep quality, the sleep quality was very much worse here than the subjects who were given smooth cortisol, than the, than the subjects who were given episodic pulsatile cortisol. And then if we're looking at mem working memory, we have a, a test called the NBAC test, which we can have as, as difficult or very difficult. And when we look at that, if we look at low demands using the smooth infusion of cortisol, the, uh, your working memory is pretty good, but as soon as you give a difficult test, it's actually very poor. And the subjects who are given pulsatile cortisol, uh, low demand, similarly, they, they responded very well. But when we had a high demand test, they, resp they were much better with their working memory than the subjects who had the smooth infusion. I was actually rather more interested in the emotional response because those of us who look after patients with Addison's disease, for instance, find that we have a lot of subjects who are complaining of uh, basically a type of apathy. It's not depression. They just don't have the energy. They don't have the interest in things which they think that they should do. So again, we compared the smooth infusion of cortisol uh, with the physiological pulsatile infusion of cortisol. And first we looked at attentional bias, so whether you tend to look more at something, one thing or something else. And we are looking here at faces, so we're looking at people who've got happy faces or they've got sad faces or well, these happy faces or fearful faces. And with the smooth infusion here, people look at fearful faces and happy faces. They don't have an emotional bias to one or the other. But when we give the pulsatile cortisol, there's a, there's an, there's a bias they much more tend to look at the happy faces. Similarly, recognition of emotional faces, so you can show people lots of different faces, and they're morphed, so you're not quite sure, is it happy, is it sad? If we look at that, we can see that the patients on the smooth infusion, really, they don't have a particular bias for, for uh, negative or positive faces, but interestingly, the patients on the pulsatile cortisol, 
tend to recognize leg negative faces less well. And interestingly, the, these changes are just the changes you see when you give antidepressants to people, either to normal people or people who are depressed. So it is, this is a really significant change. And for those of you who are interested in fMRI, on the pulse, on the pulsatile glucocorticoid rhythm, there was a much greater connectivity in response to these faces between the insula and the striatum, which fits very well with these findings. So, Having seen this, and we've obviously now got a basis for really believing that it matters to you, certainly in cognitive and emotional state, and probably in a metabolic status as well, whether you have constant or episodic infusions of cortisol, the next thing I really wanted to know was know how we can actually go and assess this uh, in normal people going about their everyday state. What I didn't want was to bring people into hospital, which is stressful, and they lose sleep because they're not used to being in an odd place and taking blood samples from them every 10 minutes or so. Uh, there are lots and lots of problems of doing that. So we wanted to find an alternative way to get around this. So this is a paper that's actually come out this week in JCNM, and I just want to show you what we did. So in the blood, 90 to 95% of cortisol is actually bound to plasma proteins, particularly CBG. In the capillary network, the cortisol is also bound to CBG. But when it goes into the tissues, the CBG doesn't go into the tissues, and you just get free cortisol in the tissues. And the free cortisol in the tissues is the, is the relevant cortisol, which is available for the cells to cross into the cells and to bind to glucocorticoid receptors and mineralocorticoid receptors and to bind to the DNA. Now, with that means we've got free cortisol actually in the tissues. How can we measure it? Well, what we did was we put a small microdialysis catheter under the skin. It's very simple to do. It's completely painless. We don't even use local anesthetic. And we infuse cortisol, or we infuse saline through this catheter and then collect it. And we've designed a particular sampler so that we can timestamp every single sample that we take. So it's a very simple thing that we can do. And basically, what you're doing is you are collecting samples of tissue fluid. And so you can measure the amount of cortisol in the tissue at any particular time. So, what there is is there's a pump. You've got this little catheter which just goes under the skin, and then the, the, we had designed this device which we call the urethm device, which can collect the samples uh, throughout the day. And this paper, which, as I say, has come out this week from Regini, just shows you what happens to cortisol, both free cortisol in the blood, uh, sorry, total cortisol in the blood, and free cortisol in the blood and in subcutaneous tissues in response to ACTH. And this is just, this is in eight people, and this is just an example in one person. And following dexamethasone suppression, looking total in serum, free in serum, and uh, free, free in the subcutaneous tissue and free in serum. So you'll see that there's, there's close parallelism, but of course, uh, in the tissues, there is a delay there's a delay which you would expect getting from the blood into the tissues. So basically, what we measure in the tissues is uh, directly proportional to what's happening in the blood after a delay. And just to say we can measure lots of things in this, uh, I'm only going to show you a limited amount. I'm just going to show you for interest. This is one subject, and we're measuring here cortis cortisol and cortisone, and you'll see the cortisol and cortisone go up at about 3 in the morning, uh, but in this one, we're actually measuring melatonin as well. We can actually measure the whole body metabolome uh, in these small samples as well. So we can measure almost anything that you want. And this, these are in ambulatory people going about going to work, going home, at home, whatever you want to do. You don't have to bring them into hospital. Is it interesting in terms of endocrinology? Uh, I'm not going to do any more than just to show you a couple of examples. This is a patient with Addison's disease. And you'll see he, ta he takes five milligrams in the morning, uh, five milligrams in the afternoon, we'll try and where we are, five milligrams midday, five milligrams in the evening, and then five milligrams, uh, 10 milligrams after he wakes up in the morning. And that is his pattern of tissue. Remember, tissue is what matters. That's where the cortisol is active. 
That's what happens in this particular subject. And just to compare you to what actually happens in a normal person, and there are a few very interesting points. First of all, clearly, in a normal person, it's an anticipatory hormone. It goes up before you wake up, which is why you feel good when you wake up in the morning. The patients with Addison's, of course, there's a delay. He can only take it once he's woken up. And so there's a huge delay in the amount that he gets. The levels of tissue cortisol are incredibly low. He's basically deprived of cortisol throughout the whole of his night, or the whole of the night, and the pattern in the rest of the day is different. We have lots of these, but this is just an example to tell you the power of doing this. If you really want to know what is going on to your hormones at the level you want to know what's happening, which is in their tissues. What about Cushing's? Uh, well, I think you can probably tell which of these is a normal patient and which patient has Cushing's. You certainly don't need to do any dexamethasone suppression tests or anything on this to make that the diagnosis. The really important thing, though, to me, is that there's a really important time uh, but between about midnight and three in the morning, uh, which in all of our patients, there's a massive difference between the patients with uh, Cushing's, whether it's pituitary or adrenal, uh, and normal people diagnostically. Uh, you just have a one-stop clinic. You don't have to do any other tests at all. So that's a useful thing to do. And then, because I'm talking to pediatricians here, uh, I just thought I'd end is one of the nice things about being able to use this is you don't take any blood. And so you actually take no blood at all. It's completely painless. And it means you can take as many samples as you want over as prolonged a period as you want without draining uh, the person of blood. So this uh, is just an example. This is a child who has had cardiac surgery. Uh, and basically, he's got this little catheter under the skin. And it's nothing to all the other things, the drains and various other things that are stuck into him. So I just want to show you what happens to the HPA axis in infants and children undergoing cardiac surgery. So this is the first one. This is uh, a 15-year-old who has valve-sparing aortic root surgery. And basically, you can see surgery is in this time here, in the spotted line here. Blue is cortisol and red is cortisone. You can see this massive increase in cortisol, these huge pulses of cortisol. I'd like to point out that people who are very interested in cortisol-cortisone ratios, if you do that based on a single blood sample, you might get a slightly different result if you did it here to if you do it here. These are very dynamic changes. The cortisol-cortisone ratios change hugely in normal people, let alone somebody undergoing surgery at the time. But that's, that's a 15-year-old. This is a one-year, two-month-year-old having a Glenn shunt. You'll see, again, these huge pulses of cortisol after surgery. You can see the smooth increase in cortisone. This is a three-month-old uh, child who's having a VSD closure. And you see, again, these huge pulses of cortisol and this slightly then these slowly increased levels of cortisone. I want you to concentrate on this because now I'm going to show you some children less uh, than one month old. And so the first thing you'll notice is there's a complete reversal here. Cortisone levels are much higher than cortisol levels, much higher. So surgery is here. You have an increase in cortisol, cortisone. Cortisone is high, and, but the cortisol levels are relatively low. So this was a 12-day-old infant with an arterial switch. This is a nine-day-old patient also having an arterial switch. This, this was a cyanotic child. Again, you'll see that there's very high levels of cortisone. And finally, I'll just show you, this is a three-day-old three child uh, that has an interrupted aortic arch surgery. And again, you'll see these really high levels of cortisone more than cortisol. And it's clear to us that up to the age of one month, there is a huge difference in the 11 beta HSD activity uh, of infants. Presumably a, a marked increase in 11 beta HSD2 activity, but maybe a decrease in 11 beta HSD1 activity. But in terms of treating infants, then of course it does mean that if you are going to have to treat them with, with cortisol, and I suspect from these, 
uh, studies, we show that they all actually have very good cortisol responses, so I think that many are given steroids when they don't need it. But if you are, then it's going to be more important for uh, infants in the first month of their life rather than any other time because they are tending to metabolize their cortisol very rapidly. Just to show you the cortisol to cortisone ratios, if they're less than a month old, uh, the cortisol to cortisone ratios are very small, but if they're over a month old, they are very, very much higher. So there are some really major differences. We haven't had time to evaluate this in detail. Yet, these are just some very early, early studies. But this is, this is looking at 30, 36 cardiac surgical infants. So, in conclusion then, <clears throat> uh, glucocorticoids are secreted both with the circadian and ultradian oscillations. It is really important. The circadian oscillations are particularly important for anticipation and anticipatory events. They go up before you wake up in the morning. Uh, and actually, they anticipate other things as well, but I haven't time to talk about that. Each ultradian oscillation is associated with the episodic GR activation, whilst MR remains occupied between the pulses. The ultradian pattern of glucocorticoid secretion determines tissue-specific genomic responses. Pulsatile cortisol secretion affects clock genes, sleep, and activity cycles. It's important for memory function. It's very important for emotional response and for brain connectivity. And finally, ambulatory, uh, automated ambulatory sampling of tissue glucocorticoids allows dynamic sampling across the 24 hours without any blood removal. So I do need to thank the people who did, uh, did all this work. The molecular and physiological work was basically run by uh, Becky Conway Campbell and Francesca Spiegel. We couldn't do this work without electronics engineers. Uh, I mean, all the, all, the, all the automated sampling that I've done in rats and in humans has been because we work very closely with electronic engineers, and these electronic engineers are the people who've created the samplers for us. We have the clinical neuroendocrinologists led by Georgina Russell, and all of these other people are, are vital to the clinical team. The work, mathematical modeling is absolutely critical. If you can model what you're doing, then you can make predictions and you can test those predictions, which is extremely important. We've had very important collaborations at Groningen, at NIH, and all the studies that we've been doing in Cushing's, uh, Addison's disease, uh, uh, and actually in hyper, uh, hyper uh, are on the Horizon 2020 program with Oyston, Husabi, Ulekampa, and Stelios Sagarakis. So just to thank, finally, to thank the people who've given us the money Thank you very much indeed.